Hello again, folks. The time has finally come for the official Homebrew Computer Club reunion Zoom meeting. And uh, boy, it sure took me a long time to plan to get things, everybody together for this historic Zoom meeting. You'd be surprised how hard it is to work through people's schedules, especially with Steve Wozniak, who is very, very, very busy. And I really thank him for spending his time and participating in the official Zoom meeting with Woz telling some amazing stories you've never heard before. The main participants in the Zoom meeting are, most of them are my Patreons who have been especially invited to participate in the Zoom meeting. Others, of course, are the founding fathers of the Homebrew Computer Club, which include Lee Felsenstein, an electrical engineer and hardware geek, Bill Claxton, all the way from Singapore. Bill was the uh, person who was with Steve Wozniak in his dorm when I met Steve the very first time. We've got Benjamin, another one of my Patreons. Some other Patreons include Alan Lundell. Alan Lundell is a uh, very, very uh, prominent member in the uh, early computer uh, movement. He wrote several books on computer viruses. Uh, Gary Cocker was one of the main people who helped participate in the development of my word processor program, Easy Writer. That will be coming up in another video. And then Andrew Madsen, another one of my Patreons, and Jeff Odgus. And just remember, you can subscribe to my Patreon page to get perks like special invitations and other historic Zoom meetings planned in the future. And just go to patreon.com forward slash JD Crunch Time and subscribe now. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, uh, we're starting the uh, first <coughs> home brew Reunion meeting on Zoom, starring Steve Wozniak here. And so uh, I'm going to start off with you, Steve, to, you can address the group and then we'll just go around and and everybody kind of give a little bit of a, of, a, of a rundown on what you guys are doing and how you got involved in the homebrew. Okay. Um, I got involved quite by accident, yeah, to tell you the truth. I, I'm very shy. I didn't really go out and find things on my own very much. In fact, during the entire Homebrew Computer Club, I never once raised my hand to speak during the mapping period. I just listened to others and was inspired by them. But to get into the Homebrew Computer Club, I was um, sitting there as developing all sorts of projects on the side for fun and not really having a place to, you know, get them in the media or anything. I didn't try to do that. And yeah, you know, worked my way through uh, video games where I discovered TV as an output device and then up to a terminal that I had built because uh, I heard about this ARPANET thing. And that was you yourself, John. You were typing on on uh, in a basement in Cupertino to a computer in Boston. And you brought up a list of uh, six computers were on the ARPANET. Yeah, I got, an, I got an ASR 33 teletype with an acoustical modem and I got it from Call Computer. Yeah. Well, when I saw that, I said, oh, my God, I want to be a part of this. And um, my genius was uh, using, you know, very few chips to do anything I wanted, you know, putting games on a TV was one thing, but it was very easy to transform and put letters and words on a TV set. And then um, at first, I just copied a schematic for a modem, or I borrowed, no, I borrowed one of those modems where you put the handset inside of a box, you know, and and <laughs> and it plays. But later on, I just copied a, um, a schematic and built a modem. I didn't design the modem part. And so I could type on a keyboard and it was, that was the most expensive thing I ever bought on the way to the Apple computers. $60 back then, it's like $600 now for an ASR 33 teletype keyboard that was not even lowercase, but I had no money. I mean, that's all I could afford. I was thankful to get one. And I would type and then put the, the ASCII codes through a modem to a far, to the ARPANET. And I could choose computers and go log in as a guest and see files and run things. And that was a real big hot thing in my life. I thought this is good. I had not, I wasn't reading popular electronics. I didn't know that there had been a TV typewriter by, oh, not Gary Kildall, but um, Don Lancaster. Yes, Don Lancaster. So I didn't know about that. And I built my own and it was uh, a little more digital. I, I looked at Don's schematic one time in my life later on, much later. And, and he used, he also worked around having very few parts, but in the analog way scheme. I like the digital because I always knew the outcome. And so I had this terminal and then uh, this friend of mine, Alan Baum, who could well be in this meeting, add a lot to it. Uh, he contacted me, he said, oh, there's a club starting up for people who have video terminals and things. 
oh, I thought, oh, good, I'll go show it off. I, I was too shy to talk, but I loved showing off my designs. And I was going to go there. And everybody was talking about this popular electronics article and a thing, a computer um, by uh, um, digital equipment. Well, I had always wanted a computer my whole life. And in the early days of microprocessors, I looked at the 4004 4 bit microprocessor. Imagining a computer that could actually run a programming language, type in a program, get an answer, was just out of bounds. So I'd given up on that and hadn't gone that direction. And the first at that Homebrew Computer Club meeting, they passed out, I don't know who did, Gordon or somebody, but passed out the data sheet of an 8008 being built by a Canadian company. Okay, I took that home with me. You know, I was all scared. I didn't know anything about this little computer stuff going on. And everyone else was into that. And, Mm -hmm. And I took home the data sheet and I said, oh my gosh, this little 8-bit 8, 8 microprocessor does all the things that in high school I would design over and over and over every mini computer that came out. I'd get a manual, which was not easy. There was no place to go get a manual, really. Um, had tricks to do in that. And I would design it. And it was the processor. So I was designing processors largely. And here was the processor on the chip. And that was all I needed to have my own computer that I told my dad Back in high school, I was going to have a 4K computer someday. And because uh, that, that was enough to run a programming language. He said it costs as much as a house. And I said, I'll live in an apartment. I was going to have that computer somehow, you know, and uh, now I could get parts and build my own. So that was the thing. Well, I saw that processor and I said, why should I be typing into a modem that goes to a far away computer? Why don't I just put on a computer, which is the brains, the microprocessor, and of course you need memory and I always liked the fewest parts. So I only went for dynamic memory. The dynamic 4K memories came out that summer of 75 in the Homebrew Computer Club. That was where I became aware of that. That meant eight chips for 4K bytes instead of 32 chips. Oh, you had to refresh them. You had to put in a signal and address every single location every 2,000th of a second. But big deal. That cost me five, uh, five chips. I already had counters there for horizontal and vertical on the TV set. So... There, so I saw the formula that first night of the Homebrew Computer Club. This is how I'm going. This is how I turn my um, my little terminal talking to faraway TVs into a real computer. And I just took the uh, the keyboard into a chip called a PIA, a parallel interface chip that just went to to where my computer used to talk a byte at a time to the internet and back. Not the internet, the ARPANET and back. Now it was typed into my keyboard and to my video display. And um, well, it already went to the video display. So um, anyway, I saw the formula and that was, I was so exciting. I got to work on that right away. And of course the trouble is brand uh, processor. I couldn't afford, afford, people were talking at that first meeting about an Intel processor being $400, you know, single quantity. Mm -hmm. uh, these numbers were out, way out, you know, that was, um, my salary at Hewlett Packard was 25k a year, and it was tough to say $400 or imagine spending it on a chip. But then I found out that as an HP employee, which I was design engineer, I could buy a Motorola processor and a PIA and a CIA, two different chips or um, serial and parallel, um, for $40. That was that was the solution. And I went in late at night into my cubicle and worked sometimes on my drafting board. I first worked some ideas out on paper for what the chips would be and then got to my drafting table and uh, and drafted it up and then plugged some chips from our chip um, from our lab. OK, anyway, that's anyway, that's how I got into the club and why I got so interested was I now had a formula to own my own computer and it worked. And when I built that thing, not only showed it off at the club, we had a computer at Hewlett Packard that 40 engineers would share. You'd sign up for a time slot and you'd be on the mini, you know, it's like a 4116 or something, but you'd be on this computer for a time slot and you could run programs to calculate your, simulate your work and whatever. And that's what I, which I would do. Now I had this little tiny computer with my own TV set sitting on my desk at Hewlett Packard and I could type in my own programs and come up with solutions and figure out, you know, feedback paths to get counters to divide by 11, even for some of the PhDs up in HP labs, I was just having time in my life. So it was a useful machine, not just fun. Of course, you had, to, you had computer games. That was the real impetus. So, so anyway, uh, the Homebrew Computer Club was the heart of it all. It's what turned me on to uh, the, the method, the, the fact that people were interested in things like computers we could afford, 
and we'd listen to, you know, um, people working at Stanford, professors and the like, you know, like Jim Warren and people from uh, Berkeley, and they'd talk about how it was going to change life totally. And I wasn't one of those people that got in the discussions. I just listened, and it was like the most incredible science fiction you ever heard. And I was just totally inspired by it. But that, you know, all of a sudden the geek was going to be important and education was going to be better and communication, being able to send messages to a lot of people to organize things quickly. Um, Lee's motivation really was, you know, he had experience trying to get the word out and then change, change data to people that were organizing against the war. And it was just so cumbersome. And now we had the possibilities of computer equipment actually doing it over the uh, phone lines. I can so, get uh, the Alan Baum up here if you want, Steve. What? I can get Alan Baum up here if you want. Why don't well, you Alan, send Alan him? would have so much to contribute. And so would a lot of other people. I met a lot of people in that club, you know, that um, I still know that uh, really, you know, <laughs> attended. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and by talking to me, like after the club and whatever, that was that was a real big motivating factor. Some of them were in high school and they liked what I was showing off. And they became such good friends that they were so important. Why would I go on and try to do bigger things, start a company even? Why would I do that if I didn't have people around me saying what you're doing is good? And so that's why when Apple went public, I even took uh, tens of millions of dollars of my stock and I gave it to five early employees because I didn't feel that we three founders of Apple should have all the wealth in the world just because we had our names on a piece of paper. A founder is somebody that helps start things in the beginning. So I went back to, uh, I think all five of those people might've been to the homebrew in the homebrew computer club or close to it. Um, Randy Wigginton, Chris Espinosa, I think Alan Baum and gave them, you know, huge rounds of stuff. I just felt they, they deserved it as much as I did. And that, cause that was really where all my inspiration came from. Then I also spent a very large amount of time over the early years of Apple Anytime a computer club, the computer clubs were minuscule, just like homebrew computer club. And then they started out with geeks and then they got a little more sophistication. They were in more cities. They started springing up. Anytime one of them invited me, I would go there because I wanted to tell them where Apple came from, where I came from. It was the homebrew computer club and having clubs is that important, you know, associating with others and sharing ideas and, and collaborating, that sort of thing. That was very important to me to get that message out. And I always paid my own way. I paid my own airplane flights. I paid for my own hotels or I stayed in people's houses when I flew out all over the world to different clubs and never even told Apple I was doing it, right. you know, because I mean, Apple would, it was too businessy. Why would they want to send me around to clubs? <laughs> so uh, Lee, uh, why don't you elaborate a little bit on the homebrew computer club since you had a great uh, uh, leading uh, role in the computer club. Uh, go ahead, Lee. Well, it started out, uh, I was just one of the people attending and I was told about it by Bob Marsh, who had, I don't know if he had received, but he had gotten a hold of one of the invitations that Fred Moore sent out. Uh, Fred Moore was this, one of these types of people who is kind of always a little bothersome because uh, he's always trying to start something uh, and doesn't necessarily know how. Now, we had the Community Computer Center in Menlo Park. This was, I called it the People's Pachinko Parlor. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a couple, had a couple of teletypes and they had modems and they would log into a time-sharing service. It was basically for the kids of uh, a lot of the employees of SRI and uh, other places. Uh, actually, by that time, Xerox Park was operational. Um, and so the kids would pay 50 cents an hour to play games on basic and they had bob albrecht's uh, books uh, uh my computer likes me when i speak basic and there's another one about basic games to work from albrecht was very fundamental in, in setting this up he ran the people's computer company which was a little tabloid underground paper for us um so that was where the that was the sort of the only public access point for computers uh, and it was in this little strip mall off in, by the creek in Menlo Park somewhere. We had to follow a circuitous route to get there. Uh, Fred um, hung out there. He was trying to establish a, uh, a resource sharing network. I uh, recently 
been shown his flyer and i remember it from back then i only remember seeing the front cover because i never opened it up um and that was something that i was trying to do too and we had by 1973 opened up some public terminals one in berkeley one in san francisco for what we call community memory which used a a, a, re, a, a, a database system we wrote uh at resource one this is a place that had in fact obtained on long-term loan which means don't send it back um the same xds 940 sds 940 that doug engelbart had used for his mother of all demos that had been returned to transamerica leasing company when they up there upgraded to his pdb 10 and they had it lying around and i won't go into all the details of how this fundraising was done uh, but it was an inside job, basically. So I had experience with that. I, I came to it with knowing that we what we really needed to be able to enable communities to, to form and continue was for people to be able to get to know who each other was and, from the, and around the issue of sharing resources. So the sharing resources idea was in the air. Uh, it was one of the uh, outgrowths of the 60s. And um, I had this, I was I had done that or helped out that project. I was a hardware guy. And uh, Fred Moore had come up with the, the same idea. So he, was, he positioned himself at the entrance to the community computer center and tried to take everybody's name and contact information so he could put them on his mailing list. And maybe, maybe they get something together. That's sort of as far as his thinking went. Down the block was uh, the slot car shop. I don't know if anybody remembers slot cars uh, that Gordon French run, ran. He was a contract programmer. He had apparently actually built what he called Chicken Hawk, which was an 8008 based home computer. I never got to see that. Um, so he was already a personal computer enthusiast. And he, he, he got to talking with Fred. And then uh, the Altair was announced uh, in Popular Electronics for January 1975. They would have seen that in about December of 1974 at the latest. Uh, and so between the two of them, they got the idea to start a little, start a club and see who came. And now, uh, it actually was, I said December 74, it had to be in, in 75 because MITS sent a review copy of their Altair 8800 around to People's Computer Company. And it got passed around to a number of people uh, for comment. And that's what precipitated the formation of the Homebrew Computer Club. And that machine was there in the Gordon French's garage when 30 people showed up in a pouring rain um, to just look at it and find out what we could learn about it from each other. Another person there was Steve Dompier, who had actually gone down to Albuquerque to you know, find out why his computer kit hadn't arrived yet. And he's a very affable person, got to talk, know everybody. And he came back and reported on what he had learned. Uh, like Mitz is this little tiny company in a strip mall next to a beauty parlor, uh, etc. cetera.